Recording. Carsten, you here? Before? Uh, doing high CPU for me at the moment, so I'm not sure how well. You're cutting in and out. Yeah, the, the problem is that WebEx is at high CPU, and I have no idea why. Seems like it's fine. You're not breaking up for me. Okay, good. Wanted to also open the minutes from last week to see what we said. I posted in the chat as well. Well, let's start um, some administrative. Uh, put the first item about the CBOR session session is being scheduled. Uh, so it's one hour and on Thursday afternoon, uh, I posted in the etherpad the conflicts. I think this is fine. We have until Friday to request in case there is something that uh, there's a conflict, but this is okay. Let us know otherwise. Also, I will send out an email for slots, but yeah, I don't expect difference from this meeting. Um, let's see. There is still the uh, OID document that, but I assume since I haven't heard anything from you, Karsten, or, or that progressed at all, or you're being focused on the documents. Yeah, I, I haven't followed the, the oil thing, but Sean said he wanted to do something there, so. Um, I expect a yeah. surprise on November 4th. You expect a surprise. Okay, I don't like surprises, but <laughs> yeah. Mm. Okay, and yeah, let's talk offline uh, about the, um, the agenda for the face-to-face. Yeah, let, let me uh, just make one comment. Sure. Uh, Working. I'm not hearing you. Hello. So there, there seems to be a new WebEx version. It, it behaves very differently, but it also runs high CPU on my box here. So I'm, I'm, I don't. Yeah. So what I was trying to say is that um, JMAP is one of uh, Barry's uh, preferred groups. So if we like to have him around, it wouldn't work for the conflict list. Okay. I mean, there is not the responsible AD nor, I don't know. What do you think? Should we um, try to? Well, Barry presumably knows that that conflict exists. So, unless we have a specific reason for saying we want him there, I think we can live with it. Might get switched around a little bit. I don't know. Oh.
wie das ist. Denn I mostly wanted to point it out. I, I we have to act, but um, ja, I want to. Du noch. Uh, anything else? Otherwise, short update on the Cibo Ray tag and sequence. They're both in our editor queue. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> that was really quick. Yeah, I uh, I noticed that uh, the Ayana of the Cibor sequence is still not okay, and I saw your email to Ayana asking, is it still not okay? I haven't checked, but I assume that there was some question that wasn't answered or something like that. So hopefully they'll get back to you, Gaston, and, and um... yeah. So, more specifications. We have a lot of very recent updates, and I think that people uh, here have not had time to to read them. Mostly people who were sleeping. But, uh, maybe we can take a second to look at them. I'm gonna give you the oh yes, and the goal would have been to start a working group plus call um, from the version that would have come out today. We can yeah, let's do that now. I'll make you presenter cast then. We hear you. Yeah, I'm still having problems here. So okay. There will be some weirdness, uh, but I'm going to try to share my slides. Does this work for you? It works. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, there, there should have been a, a dash or eight out uh, today. And uh, right now, I only get to work on this at, at weird hours. Um, the, the current status is uh, there, there are uh, five pull requests or group of pull requests that, that were uh merged and um so in particular we we now have an appendix for the non-well-formed examples and we actually have one appendix now uh not two um uh, we now build the definition of deterministic on the definition of preferred uh, which i think is, is a better chance at, at actually being consistent. Uh, we remove this uh, concept, uh, but th there are still some some remaining. Uh, in in five point eight, we will get to that. Uh, we now have defaults for the JSON to Cibor conversion, and we clarified the tag validity for text four, which is embedded Cibor and 36, which is mime. But we will come back to mime, mime in a second, but at least. It takes the form of five. Uh, 124. Uh, adds a reference to RFC 86 um, to the appendix about comparing CBOR to other formats. Uh, it, it seemed to me that instead of updating that appendix, uh, what some amount of probably uh, easy to, to do the work, and actually somebody did 
in RFC 8618. Uh, so we can just point to that. So th this doesn't take away from the existing uh, two additional uh, formats. Um, so th this is essentially two lines or three lines of pointing to, to that RFC. Um, th there was a markdown problem, some, some recent change we made on, on tag 4.5, so that's really trivial. And uh, Jeffrey uh, mentioned a long time ago that, that the language on, on using integers for small keys uh, was a little weird. And uh, that's uh, 128, fixing that is 128. And finally, the, there's now a small change. just make sure that the term is in the um, but uh, we, we're not trying to invent new terms um, that distinguishes the data model level data items uh, from the serialization level uh, data items so I think these can be uh, ticked off pretty quickly um, so I'm, I'm just waiting for for Paul to a and then we have uh, the non trivial one, which is a rather big uh, pull request, the one twenty seven. Uh, there was some there was some remnants about the tag language. Actually, there are still some remnants about the tag language, tag language that we could address. Uh, but I think the, the most important parts are uh, done now. Uh, we have some more clean up of the terminology uh, of um, We now have a term called tag content, uh, which we occasionally use. So the, the thing that is in a tag, tagged item, we call it tag content now because Tagged item is not really clear whether it means the the item without the tag or the item with the tag. Um, and uh, five point three has been split up into basic validity versus tag validity. So the the tag part <coughs> now is is separate, and it it actually talks about visible content values now that that wasn't in the previous version uh, of that sections but for for some tags of course it's important that not only the type of the content is the wrong that's required um, by the tag optional tagging in the document and i, I try to get rid of this so basically the idea is that there might be some protocols that allow you to put a tag uh, but don't really need that because the the information uh, how to interpret the, the uh, data there is already provided by the schema and uh, in, in the protocols we have done recently we, we always have avoided doing that that that's not not a good thing to do because in the end it means you you have to interoperability test both variations and so on it's much better to simply decide whether you want to tag somewhere or not so optional tagging is is not really happening happening very much in in practice and so i And we lock you keys, yeah. and these big nums actually encode the same value using. Karsten, you're mostly cutting out in the last 60 seconds. I'm not hearing anything.
and here you go then. Okay, one, two, three. Yeah. It's using up a lot of CPU on my machine. Try, are you doing via the browser or? No, I have the application. The application apparently is a new version because it had a lot of cleanup in the dialogues. It's it's much uh, better now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's you. Mostly we can hear you, but then there are like longer periods, like five seconds, that we completely miss what you're saying. Yeah, that's a typical symptom of high CPU because things get queued and and uh, sent at some point, but then at some point the queue actually needs to flush, and and then you miss. Uh, um, yeah, but it's it seems to be working now. So. Okay, so I was talking about the the semantic equivalence tags. If you have a map. Uh, say big nums as map keys, and these big nums use uh, different representations of the same number, which is possible with leading zeros. An implementation that uh, actually uh, is using the the semantics of the tag as map key and and not the syntax. So that, that there is some text covering that as well. And uh, we could add some some of the disc talked about. That is not yet uh, in there. So uh, it, it, there was no obvious place to, to put this, so I didn't put it in. So this is something that, that probably needs a lot of scrutiny before we uh, put it in. There is some work remaining, unfortunately. Uh, so I think that there are some 10 issues open. Um, there are two issues that I think we can close now. And uh, I think we, I, I just. Five point eight. Lawrence pointed this out, and the remedy is, I think, uh, obvious. Move more of the uh, text from five point eight to five point three. you again, Karsten. Yes, the, the, so there, I, there is some heard, stuff in there that... We lost you for a moment. The last thing I heard was move most of 5.8 to 5.3. Yeah. Uh, try to use the browser version of WebEx to see if that helps it's me but no it's it's i'm losing it too didn't hear what you said much of it i said that uh, i lost you last thing i heard was to move most of 5.8 to 5.3 then i didn't hear anything and I was saying maybe uh, uh, if you could try switching to the browser version of WebEx. How do I do that? So you have to, I guess, leave the meeting and then go back to, uh, let me link the WebEx link, or you have it in the slides anyway. And there is, yes. instead of joining, there is uh, next to it, uh, join uh, via browser or something like that. Okay. I will try. 
or yeah, you can probably stay in the meeting while you try to rejoin the browser. I need to leave. Uh, from your browser, some of the really weird. Yeah, but it doesn't. I don't know if Kasten can hear. Um, if, if you're trying to communicate, use the chat. I'm not sure that we can hear you. Casting again. Can you hear me? It doesn't break break again, but yeah, I have no idea whether I'm really using the web version, but at least it says it it's in Chrome now. Uh, so maybe that's good enough. Your one that you were using before. So using your CPU. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I had to to kill that process. Uh, I couldn't actually do anything on my computer anymore. Can I share from the web version as well? So I just made you a presenter. So the ball it says. So where do I do that? I don't know because I'm not using <laughs> the version. I don't know if your screen there are bubbles and one of them is like a bucket with an arrow, which is share.
Well, that appears to be a beta feature. Uh, now it's stuck again. I posted the slides, uh, and I can also share if you prefer. Slides. Yeah, th th there are only three slides left, so maybe that's easier. I share then. I think we were on slide six. Yeah, so the idea was to um, merge these two sections, make sure we have less redundancy, and uh, really separate the discussion of deterministic encoding from the discussion of validity. And then we have two paragraphs left in 5.8 uh, that really are about security considerations and we might want to move them there. And in, in Lawrence's uh, comment, there's also the idea of Seabor firewalls. I'm not entirely sure what that would be. Section 5.8 does discuss firewalls today. Yes, but does it discuss CBOR firewalls? Uh, that's what I thought it was. I think it was more about uh, uh, firewalls looking at CBOR data and making decisions based on that CBOR data, but CBOR firewalls. So you, you wouldn't talk about the current certificate firewall, even if it does something with this. Okay, well, um, th that's what I was thinking about um, when I thought of Seabor uh, firewalls, is, is some firewall that does, that looks at Seabor and okay. rejects it, or so th that's all I was thinking there. So maybe that's not the right terminology, but some discussion of, uh, any, any discussion about, uh, Firewalls processing Seabor, I think, would be better in a separate section. Go to the security considerations, or do we put it somewhere else? Uh, I think somewhere else. I mean, I have a pretty strong opinion that they're just a nice to have. They're kind of a little uh, um, extra you know, bonus security, they're, they're never to be relied on. Well, that, that's true for firewalls in general, but um, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a proposal for, for that later this week. <clears throat> okay, but at least we, we don't need the term Seba firewalls, which uh, uh, I think it's good to know. So that that's the biggest one, I think. Uh, then we have a few minor items to discuss, slide seven. Um, the binary MIME thing. Um, we made the mistake uh, in 2013 of saying that tag 36 is only for text-based MIME. And and th that is of course not true. 
not, not useful. And uh, yeah, we already have tag 257. Um, so we, we have a number of things we could do. We could simply ignore the whole thing and, and not discuss it. Or we could add a reference to the registration of tag 257, which would not be a normative reference, of course, uh, just to complete the picture. Yeah, so I missed the, the, the 257 in my read for some reason or other. Um, uh, somehow it's not, uh, I, I don't know, I, I guess I should go, go back and check. Um, it's not in the document, it, it's in the registry. Ah, okay. <laughs> That's why I was confused. Okay. And, uh, uh, my, my proposal was uh, not to deviate from the decision we made that we will only discuss the tags uh, that, that are in 7049. But on, on, at this point, just add a reference and say, if you want binary MIME, there's another tag you can look at. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that would have some would have uh, solved it for me. Because, um, yeah, I, I remember we discussed it, then I was surprised to not even see anything there. Um, one other question, though, there's there's really three types of MIME. There's 7-bit MIME, which is uh, US ASCII less than 1,000 characters per line. 8-bit MIME, which is uh, actually allows the 8th bit to be set, but it's still limited to 1,000 characters per line. And then there's binary MIME. Maybe, so, so I'm not clear, um, you know, tag 36 is clearly 7-bit MIME, and tag 257 is clearly binary MIME, but where does 8-bit MIME fit? Well, that depends on whether it's valid UTF-8 or not. It's, it's, it's not UTF-8. MIME is never UTF-8. Well, that, that's not true. If, if, uh, if you happen to have 8-bit MIME that, that uh, is entirely constructed from UTF-8 characters, uh, you can still use tag 36. But I think the normal situation would be to put 8-bit MIME into tag 257. Do you think there is a need to identify MIME as 8-bit MIME? Just, yeah, I'm just trying to get, be sure I'm clear about what's going on here. Um, It's kind of, and I guess that's true that you could represent 8-bit MIME with UTF-8. Seems a bit weird, but. There is certainly 8-bit MIME that is not UTF-8. So that, that would always have to go into byte strings. Seven bit mime. No, there's no question that seven bit mime would fit in a text string because it only uses the US ASCII characters and that's the UTF 8. You know, US ASCII is the, is the seven bit characters in, in, in UTF 8. Um, uh, but um, and I, th if you're doing um, eight bit mime, I mean you could have uh, a, a content, you know, a text type with a character set that's not UTF eight. Right. It'd be UTF thirty two or something, right? Um, so. That seems pretty weird to to slot that in as tag thirty six. Yeah, so I think the the normal thing you would do is put it under tag two fifty seven. Right. So, um, maybe it's worth mentioning that seven, uh, you know, tag thirty six is seven bit mime, and tag two fifty seven is eight bit and binary mime. I don't think people use eight bit or binary mime much. It's Primarily seven bit mime, but
can do that, yes. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good to me. Okay, the, the next uh, there was an issue 67 about handling unknown tags and unknown simple uh, values. I think that there is some, some pretty good text in there now. Uh, the question is, do we have to expand on that? We have an opinion on that. Is that text? Uh, it's issue sixty-seven. No, no, the text in the document. Um, I think it's in several places, and uh, some some of the work on um, section five point eight and five point three will probably move it around. Let me try to find it. Uh, there is a section 5.4, and there is some text in 5.8, and we would probably consolidate this a little bit. So maybe we can just try to handle 67 uh, in the work for 122. You really need to read Jeremy's, uh, Jeffrey's um, issue there. I'm trying to pull this up. Yeah, I think this is really a detail that maybe we can address in 122. Yeah, I think this is fairly small, yeah. And then there is this uh, um, number 63, uh, which I think is hard to solve because it's an unsolvable problem. And uh, we essentially have to say how to live, how to uh, properly live with that unsolvable problem. Yeah, 
given that what we're talking about here is something you're not supposed to ever be in a situation of doing, I'm not too sure I care about telling people how it has to be solved in any specific decoder. Yeah, I think that, that that's a pretty good description of where we are or where we were. Um, but I think uh, Jeffrey wanted to be a little bit more specific here, but I, I don't know how how to do that. Um, why don't you ask him to provide a pull request? And if he doesn't, we'll go ahead and just close it. Okay, sounds good. Okay, then we can go to slide eight. Uh, so we ha still have the not a number thing, um, where I think 99.7% uh, of all SIBO applications don't care. Uh, but we should explain how to run bombs. Uh, so this is the the discussion we had on uh, clamping uh, unit arrays uh, to the power of ten. Because if you manage to sm smuggle a, a signaling NAN into an application, that that might blow up at any uh, place, uh, so I think that needs uh, some discussion. Um, but on the other hand, we do want to allow the the use of all IEEE 754 if, if applications really want that. So my proposal would be to say that, that um, a sane CBOR implementation should provide this one quiet NAN that <clears throat> the text is already talking about. And there might be options in the API to enable more uh, if the application is, is up to handling this. But really the, the default one NAN only. So since nobody on the call actually cares about floating point, I think that that's hard to discuss. We have to find some people who, who do care about floating point. I care, I'm just not up to speed on this. Yeah, 7049 was kind of cavalier about uh, NANs and, and essentially uh, was uh, mapping everything to the single quiet NAN, but that's of course not, not quite true. Um, so actually when IEEE 754 uh, was revised uh, last year, they actually put in some more text about the, the same problem. Uh, because they also noticed that, that the way NANs are handled uh, creates interoperability uh, problems. But we really probably not would need an expert on this to, to do exactly the right thing here. So leaving it to, to the implementers to provide great APIs to different versions of handling this sounds like, like a good cop-out. parser that actually cares about it will get it right. Most likely. Okay, and the, the final issue, 92, uh, Peter Oxel uh, noticed that uh, there are some tags out there that are a bit weird because they care about the relative order. And at the data model level, you don't know the relative order. Um, so we probably need some text somewhere and I haven't quite found the right place 
that explains that this is something you can do but should not do. And that's it. So if you want anything else fixed, uh, please write your issues now. Um, on uh, number 71, that uh, is described valid, invalid for every type. Um, in my last read, I went through everything and check that. And um, my conclusion is you can close that, that. Yeah, can you please close it because it's your issue? Oh, okay, I see. And the same is true for 45. All right. Okay, thank you. The plan now, Karsten, is to do the updates that uh, we discussed and contact Jeffrey and, yeah, everything we talked about. Um, when will we get the next version to be able to start a working group last call? I hope by the middle of next week. Next week. Sounds good. Uh, we do have a next interim in two weeks. Uh, that would be, I think, the 6th of November. So today is after the submission deadline. Yes. Mm. We, if we need it, we would, I guess then we will have started a working group last call. And I wanted to, yeah, I don't know if we'll get any any comment by then though because right. of the mission deadline let's let's see if we still have it uh if if it brings up anything i think we might cancel it don't have much to talk about make sure to let me know and also i wanted to point out that the uh the time for uh, U.S. people is different, I think, because we change time. That's true of next week, but not of the week 45. So at, that, at that time, we are aligned again. Okay, okay. Then discard that. Good. So we have to do something about the core interim next week. Uh, but yeah. fortunately, it's only one one week where we are out of sync in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's it. So we will wait on this uh, on the next update and looking forward to the discussion with. Let's see if Jeffrey. Yes, and please please do review pull request one twenty seven. That too. Okay. Business. Sorry for my technical problems. Uh, hope to be set up better next time. It's worked, so that's that's good. <laughs> At least we fixed it. Then uh, we can close the meeting. Thank you for calling in. Thank you. Bye.